The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. Um, I'm very grateful. Um, I was contacted by, uh, by some CloudStack guys just a few days ago and asked if I'd be willing to, uh, to give a talk in here. So a little, little short notice, um, but very, very always excited to talk more about SALT. Now, now who in here has heard of uh, SALT or SALTStack before? There's one tentative hand. <laughs> I Googled it. <laughs> we, uh, so Salt is a, is a very, very new player in the automation space. And we're taking, we're taking a, real, a real different approach to, to cloud and infrastructure automation and configuration management. And so it's been, it's been really exciting. We've been growing at a ridiculous pace. Uh, we really came out last November. Um, but our, but our user base has been growing very, very quickly. We're in a lot of enterprises at this point. Um, and, and our contributor base is massive. We've got over, um, right now we're at 119 contributors. Uh, many of them are active. And so the project, um, all in all, has been growing very, very quickly. So basically, SALT. SALT is a slightly different approach to the whole automation space. And the idea being that if we solve fundamentally the problem of remote execution and make that fast enough that we can query live data about an infrastructure and make decisions about that, then that's going to be a very enabling, um, a very enabling component. And we can then build more pieces of software and more functionality on top of this remote execution. And so the remote execution system that we have is very, very, very fast. I spent, I, I've, I spent many, many years trying to figure out the best way to write a remote execution platform that is fast enough to query live state data over large installations. So one of our, one of our best examples was um, a supercomputer deployment um, that was put out recently. Um, some guys at Harvard that put salt on one of their supercomputers came back and said that they, the, the way that they used to use remote execution across their supercompute node of, or their supercompute cluster of 1800 nodes was taking them about 15 minutes to query all of their nodes. And they switched to salt and now it takes them five seconds. Now the next main goal of SALT is to make everything as ridiculously simple to use as possible, to make it intuitive and to make it very easy to set up, very easy to deploy, and very easy to manage. So as I've been saying, the core concept with SALT is that it's, on, that it's founded on remote execution. And it's, again, ridiculously fast, um, works very quickly over the internet or in a private infrastructure environment. There's no middleware involved. When you set up SALT, um, all you have to do, you set up a master that's sending out commands and set up minions. It's all written in Python. So we're, we're in Fedora, we're in EPEL, we're in a number of other distributions, we're in the FreeBSD ports tree. So yes. Both. We, um, well, I'll talk about the configuration management component here in a minute. Um, but SALT, we, we have a lot of, we have a number of, um, sorry? Right. The question was, is this a, is this a complement or a comp or a competitor to Puppet and Chef? And the answer was both. We actually have a number of deployments that are using SALT's remote execution engine to manage um, to, to manage Puppet. And we also have a number of uh, deployments that have, that have replaced tools like Puppet and Chef. 
and we have a number of deployments that have went with SALT as opposed to going with other configuration management systems. So one of, the, one of the main goals is that it's a very flexible system that can work with whatever, whatever infrastructure you throw it at. So anyway, back to remote execution. So there's no middleware. We've done this by, um, by building out the, all of the remote execution layer on top of a library called 0MQ, which is a fairly new networking medium that's been developed that allows for high-speed network communication. So we don't need to rely on, say, uh, RabbitMQ or ActiveMQ middleware anywhere. Everything's directly built in. And then the remote execution itself comes with a very rich API. So you're not just using it to execute random commands. When you send a, when you send a command out over SALT's remote execution system, um, those can be normalized to the operating systems that you're sending them out to. Um, they can do very complex operations on, on the target systems. We're not limited to just the shell. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that API looks like here in a few minutes. Now, using, using SALT itself is fairly straightforward. The installation, all you have to do is set up a SALT master where you're sending commands out from. And then on all of your systems, you set up what we call a salt minion. And that checks back into the master and awaits for commands. Now, when we send out these commands, what we, what we do, invoke salt, we give a target as to who's going to execute that command. In this case, we're saying everybody. And then the module and function that we want to execute. So let me see if I can. I'm going to try and get, uh, get some demos up here as we go on. I'm going to go over some basic information and then move into those. But so fundamentally, we're able to target any system out there with a lot of granularity. We can target them based on system properties or system name, or by combining a number of different target aspects to figure out exactly who needs to execute the command that we're sending out. It's all, it's all custom built on top of 0MQ. So what we've done is that instead of, instead of using an existing protocol, we've built one using, using 0MQ that, um, that is optimized for sending this traffic out. So it's incredibly low, um, low overhead on the network. Uh, it's actually been really nice. A lot of people have come back and said, I'm trying to figure out where all of the salt communication is happening, and here's my TCP dumps, and, and I don't see anything substantial. And we always have to point out and say, no, it's those few bits right over there. So. Yeah, how it works is that, the, is that we've got, uh, it's a pub-sub mechanism. So it's a, it's a publication coming out of the master, and then all of the minions are subscribing. They, they get that piece of information from the master that includes what is going to be executed and the arguments for that execution. And, they, and it also includes what we call the matcher information so that the minions know whether or not they're going to execute that um, execute that command. Does that answer your question? Okay. All right. So on top of remote execution, we've built what we call state management, which is the configuration management system that's used by SALT. Now, again, the goals and the, and the design aspects of SALT's state management system is that it's declarative in nature, so it's similar in that, in that sense to how Puppet configurations are set up. Um, instead, of using, instead of using a domain-specific language to set up all of your configurations, we use data structures. And then we represent those data structures any way that you want to. And so by default, they're represented in YAML, 
and very straightforward. And again, I'll show some demos here in a minute as to what those look like. And so you've got just straightforward YAML or anything that you want. If you, for some reason, despise YAML and think that XML is a wonderful, wonderful thing, then you could write them in XML. If you felt as though it would be to your benefit to write your own language to interpret solid state, you could do that. Now, again, everything that's been made has been made to be very extensible. So I'm debating as to how I'm going to get the right window up in here efficiently. Let me, let me do a quick demonstration on how on what these salt states look like. Let's see if this uh, There we go. Salt is all open source. It's up on GitHub. We've got a repository up here of salt states. So to demonstrate, let's say that we wanted to set up, let's take a look at uh, HAProxy here. So we create a module, give it an SLS file, and then we declare what's going to happen. So for people, again, who are familiar with, with a system like Puppet, we're here saying HAProxy, that's a package, make sure it's installed, make sure the service is running, make sure that service is running after HAProxy is installed. So the goal, again, to make, to make the declaration as, as terse as possible. And so in this case, we've got a single stanza, and in that stanza, we're managing a package, a service, and the config files for HAProxy. And then these can become, these can get a little more com complicated. We can look here at a, at a MongoDB setup that's going to automate the creation and deployment of a MongoDB replica set. So we've got an include statement. We're including another module. We're able to see MongoDB, make sure that package is installed, make sure the service is running, only start the service once these files are set up. Make sure that the users and groups are, are there, set up directories. Um, and set up individual configuration files. Any questions so far? Is this making any sense at all? Okay, I just worry because people walked out. That's, that's never fun. <laughs> All right. Let me get these slides back here. So there's a number of concepts that, uh, that we've employed in SALT in the configuration management component to try and make it very intuitive to people who already deploy and manage um, infrastructures. So we, we're trying to follow more Unix-like philosophies where we've got a lot of small pieces of data that are all separated and, and interconnected. We've got, uh, and, everything, and everything is a file. We don't have any magic paths or assumptions that something's going to be in certain locations. Um, I already mentioned that, the, uh, that all of the configuration management is done through, uh, through data structures, which makes it not only generic and, and easy to understand and use, but more importantly, it makes it very, very pluggable. It's very easy to take another application and generate all of the data that you would need to do all of your full automation, because you can just dump it all from a data structure. Yes. Uh -huh. Does it go back and check if you did not take the or is it only to the initial install file? OK, 
Okay, the, the question was, going back here to this MongoDB example, that we are configuring a bunch of config files and asking if it's going to, if SALT is going to be checking ongoing if there are changes in those files or if they need to be, um, or if, it if it's just a one-time deal. Um, and the answer is yes. It is going to be, it does actively check for changes and modifications in those files um, and then updates those files if you change them uh, on, on the master side. So if you, change, if you change these files and then push a new deployment, it'll apply those patches for you. Yes? So there, so the question is, is remote management and, um, remote yeah, re remote, their remote deployment and configuration management, are they separated or are they part of the same system? And uh, they're, they're very much integrated. The, the remote execution and remote management system is the same backplane that's used for all of the communication and all of the file deployment, as well as being used as the backplane for uh, communicating the commands to actually run state deployments. So instead of, um, well, it, it makes it very easy to run these, run these remote executions to say, you guys run this particular state execution at this time and control it all from the master, or you can control it all from the individual minions. So the goal there being that it's more flexible, but that they're very closely integrated. And then going back into the question of integration, when we look at this, for instance, let's see. We've got a state here called package, and it's making sure that that package is installed. So if it isn't installed, it'll install it. Um, but in an earlier slide, there was an example of a remote execution command, which was pkg.install. So the way it is set up is that this state function runs a few checks and then calls that module in the background that you would call via remote execution anyway, which means that on the high level, we're able to simplify what's going on in a file like this, but every layer of management is exposed so that you can directly access it if you want to. Does that answer your question? Okay, thank you. Okay, this is a uh, YAML file, and like I said, this can be written in just about anything. I'm trying to think of where one that I think that this guy's got an example of what you're asking. The question was, what if those files are different or in different locations on different distributions? Good. So inside of these SLS files, since they can be rendered any way that we want, we've got a system called renderers. By default, it's where we use what's called the YAML Jinja renderer. So it first runs it through a Jinja interpreter and that Jinja interpreter gets embedded with a lot of information. And so we've got the OS checking to see if it's Red Hat, then make sure that the name is changed or added in line. Similarly, if you can't stand Jinja, you can use the YAML Mako, or you could make your own. But so we've got a bunch of information embedded in here. Also, and I'm sure I'll stumble across one of these examples here in a few minutes, we're using grains, but we've got a lot of data that gets embedded inside of these templates. So in, in line, in your SLS file, when it's rendered, you can execute any of the modules that are available in the module API. And so actually, let me show you, let me, let me do a quick overview of what, of what that looks like. So when you run the remote execution and going back um, to that pkg.install, 
that pkg.install is going to automatically map back to the right module. So let's say we're running, here we go, let's say we're running a Red Hat or Fedora system and it's using yum, then it's automatically going to detect that that's a Red Hat system and execute one of these functions in here. I'm looking for installed, or install, there we go. And so we've got a, a, a pretty rich API of different parts of the system that we can interact with as well as a lot of different platform integration. And anything inside of here can also, like I was saying, be run directly from the SLS files to gather any piece of data that you want. Does that answer your question? Okay. Now we've done a number of things that make um, that make salt run very very quickly. So and and be very low impact on a system. So we don't we don't set up an event loop or anything like that when we're doing a state run. Everything is run in a completely linear fashion. Um, and yeah, everything's been engineered with performance in mind, because your your configuration management should not get in the way of your system management. Now, setting up and installing Salt, again, there's no middleware, there are no extra servers involved. All you have to do is yum install or install from an existing package tree or install our PPA for the Ubuntu packages and apt-get install Salt. So you, you apt-get install a Salt Master, turn it on, service Salt Master start. Um, apt-get install or yum install the minions, turn them on. The only configuration that's required to get salt up and running is that the minions need to know where the master is. So you either add a, add a, add a one-line one config change on the minions that specify where the master is or a DNS entry for, for the name salt and then they'll just find it. And then once they check in, all of the encryption and authentication is done with RSA keys. And so when a minion checks in, the master will have access to its RSA key. You run salt key and you'll list all of those keys that are available and that's it. Generally speaking, people have come back and said that they had looked at a number of other configuration management or remote execution platforms and um, they'll come back and say, I set, up X, I set up system X and it took me two weeks. I set up system Y, it took me two days. I set up salt, it took me 10 minutes. So, getting that master ready to deploy states, that's also, it's, it already works. It's all built in. So you don't have to add any extra stuff to be able to do configuration management. There's a configuration inside of the, uh, inside of the salt config file called file roots. And by default, it points to the slash SRV slash salt. I know we can have debates till the cows come home about whether or not that's the right place to put it. <laughs> but you can change that obviously to wherever you'd like. And then you just start chucking SLS files in there and it just works. Okay. I want to talk a little bit about how we design these configuration management trees. Um, hopefully we can get a, a basic understanding across fairly quickly and get a better idea as to, as to what they look like. Now, hmm, I'm hoping my internet's still working. If I go back to uh, some of our demo states here. So this is what the root of an SLS, of a salt configuration tree is gonna look like. One of the most important files is called this top file right here. And so this is where we map what modules are going to be used by what systems and what environments they're all going to be in. So we're able to declare environments. In this case, we've got just the base environment, which is the default. And then we're able to specify that anybody with a name of WebServe and match it based on a file system glob is going to have all of these modules associated with it. 
And then down here we add anybody with an OS of Red Hat, and we're matching based on a grain, is going to have a few additional components inside of it. So, yes? Yes. Right. Right. Exactly. So you're able to match. So you're able to match. The question is, is whether or not is just to verify that this is a name. These names, by default, go back to the host name of the system that you're attaching to, but they can also be statically configured on the system. So they don't have to be the host name. And then we've got system properties, which we call grains, that we can match against. And so in this case, what's going on is, um, is exactly what you're saying. That any OS that, that's, or any system that's checking in and is running FreeBSD, for instance, is going to add these modules. You good? OK. All right, so if we go back up here and we look at WebServe, and we see that it's going to be including this Apache module, then we say, well, where the heck is that? So we go back, and there's an Apache directory. That Apache directory has a slow internet connection to GitHub. There we go. Has, and sorry. This init.sls file. If a file is named init.sls, then it's the name of the directory. Otherwise, if we go back and we look at, here we go, edit.vim. That means that it's going to be in the edit directory, which I know it's alphabetical. I should have scrolled down, dot vim. So everything represented on a very flat file system basis, OK? And so our associations are very, very direct. Any questions? Is anybody horribly confused by what I just said? Is anyone too embarrassed to admit that they're horribly confused by what? There we go. Yes? So the question was, if I wanted to install package foobar, one of my personal favorites, um, is, that, is that do we create an init.sls inside of one of these directories and create a directory? And the answer is yes. Um, so let's see. I'll, we've got Redis here. And so let's say we want to install the Redis package. We've got a Redis directory and an init.sls inside here. And we've got the Redis package installed. And then we associate this module inside of our top file with, with a certain server. Might actually not even be listed here. Yeah. Oh, there we go. So Redis is going to be anybody, any server that checks in with a name starting with WebServe is going to parse over this Redis init.sls, because we named Redis in that list in the top file. And it's going to make sure that first the package is installed, verify that it's installed, and then verify that the service is up and running. Um, right now, we, so it automatically detects what package manager to use based on the distribution that you're on. Right now, the, the question was, which package manager do we support? Or package managers do we support? Um, we support packages, and we support, oh, excuse me, um, Yum, v, so Fedora and Red Hat. We support Zipper for SUSE. We support um, Apt for Debian and Ubuntu. We support uh, Pacman for Arch Linux. We support uh, FreeBSD packages. Um, we have a package system in place that allows for the installation of software on Windows. Um, and I'm sure I'm forgetting some. We've got a few more platforms in there. Sorry? OK. <laughs> 
We're, we're always trying to get more platform support in here. OK, any other questions? Or, yes? Uh, the question is where are the packages that, that are installed stored? And that depends on you. By default, these installed packages um, are going to be installed via the repository that is configured on the server. So if, so if your repo is configured to download from the internet, they'll download from the internet. If your repo is configured to download from a local repository server, they'll download from a local repository server. And so if you wanted to manipulate where those packages are being installed from, you would set up a repository that is going to be mandated as your default repository inside of your states to, to change that just before you install any packages. Does that answer your question? Excellent. Yes? So the, the question is is that so, sometimes we don't want sometimes we don't want a, a VM or a system to be going out to the internet to getting packages. Sometimes we want to change change that workflow. And so you've got a number of options there. Um, one one option would be that you did store your packages on the solid server. I generally would recommend that approach, but but it's doable. Um, generally, what I would recommend would be to have a package repository. Um, that's specific for your deployment distribution. So run, run good old create repo if you're running yum distros or use uh, like rep repo if you're Debian based or something like that. So that you've got a local repository and then make sure that before those packages are installed, you've configured that, that repository on the, on the systems. And it's actually very easy. Inside of Salt, we've got a few, a few extra options when we, when we go into a little more depth that make ordering uh, the sequence of installation very, very straightforward. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. And I have another question there. Most of the time, uh, we, we do get SSL packages installed and then make additional configurations to the system. So, for example, I need to restart my networking and then I need to have an additional room in my database. So, those are some other things commands that I see the system wants to manipulate in jump. So, how do I go about doing all these steps? So the, the thing the, the question was is oftentimes we need to we need to run a number of one-off commands with the initial setup of a system and how do we order those? How do we get how do we put those commands in? Now, for the most part, there, there are going to be modules and state files that can do a lot of those commands for you. And um, and we're constantly building more and more of them. But uh, if you do need to run individual commands, then Actually, I'm wondering if I've got an example of that up here. This is going to be a horrible one, I'm sure. Is that even in here? But we do have, there we go. We do have a, st a state that is CMD, so that we can run one-off commands and then require that they're run, and we can run them only under certain circumstances so that they only end up getting run once. We can very easily say, that, say we want to run, like you, like you said, an IP table command, and we want that IP table command to be, um, to only be executed if it hasn't already been executed, then we could, we could put the um, IP table command um, right up there where we've got the command, then say CMD run, and then put only if, and then another command that's going to check to see if it's already been executed. Is that okay? All right. We good?
Okay. Now, I talked a little bit about this top file that does all the man mapping and management for you. Um, but it is, it is possible, depending on how you want to deploy your systems, to avoid using a top file. Uh, you can, for instance, go in and execute commands that say, skip the top file, and I know what modules I want, so just install them, which means that it's easier to automate on a higher level. Just to get that last tidbit in for that slide there. Now, actually, I've covered this a lot already, talking about what the SLS files are made of. But fundamentally, under the hood, we've got um, a a specification for a data structure, which we call high state data. And then and we've got uh, the full specification is spelled out in our documentation. And that high state data structure is what is what you're seeing inside of these YAML files. And so again, defaults to YAML. If you want to, you can you can declare this high state data structure in pure Python um, or in anything that you can you can dream up so long as you're willing to write the renderer, the system that we need to actually convert it into that data structure. It's also possible to mix them. So let's say, I think, yeah. So we've got our standard SLS files here, they're YAML. But let's say that for some reason, we wanted one to be written in pure Python. And we wanted it to be checked in with all the rest because there was just something that, you know, we needed to do more with this particular SLS file than was available inside of, um, inside of Jinja and YAML. So what we do here is we give it a, a artificial shebang line because who doesn't know what those are, right? that say we're going to use the pi renderer instead of whatever the default is set at. And then it's going to use a different render system to get that data. And, and we see a raw data structure here. So this is actually pretty similar to some of the other ones we've seen, include Python and then package.installed. And so it's not unlike just doing one of these in YAML. All right. We've got a few more minutes. When, when am I supposed to kick out? 10 minutes too? OK. Right, right, right. Oh, that's right. Lunch is after this, which means I have the only real competition. <laughs> I, uh, actually, I'll, I'll tell a quick story. I, I was teaching a class for Red Hat a few years ago in San Francisco, and then this training center at 2 o'clock every day would pull cookies out of the oven. And it was Monday, and, um, and they pull the cookies out at 2, the scent wafts through the air, and there's a, um, a fairly a larger commanding gentleman in the front row. The, the scent enters the room, and he goes, cookies. I'm mid-sentence, talking, stands up, walks out. The whole class follows him. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I realized at that point that there are some things that you just can't compete with. So yeah, I'll, I'll not keep you over, over lunch. OK. Now I have alluded to a number of things on this list in talking about kind of how salt works and trying to convey the idea um, as, as to how salt works. We took a look at modules, and we looked at one of the, we looked at the yum package module. The modules is where is the workhorse. That's where all of these functions and declarations and platform support and integrating with MySQL or integrating with heaven knows what. That all happens in modules. Grains is where we've got all of this static system data, like what operating system it is, what our memory is. Um, it's, I don't like to parallel it to factor, for those of you familiar with Puppet, um, but it does some of the similar, similar functionality. 
We've got renderers. Renderers, we talked a little bit about those. The default one is that YAML Jinja renderer so that you can declare SLS files in YAML and run them through a Jinja interpreter. We've got returners. So when you execute a salt command, it doesn't necessarily need to send that data back to the master. It can send it wherever the heck you want or to as many places as you want. And we can do that with returners. So that you say, I'm going to execute this command. It's going to run in 10,000 nodes. But oh, I don't care what the return is back at the command line that I'm sending it from. I want that data to all get shoved into some database somewhere. And so we can do that with returners. Runners allow us to run more complicated things on the master. So for instance, one of the runners that, that we're working on right now is going to manage state runs for you from the master instead of ever setting up cron jobs on the minions or anything like that. And then states are the, are the, are the things that allow us to manipulate the actual salt states. And so let me go back and illustrate, or not illustrate, directly show how these work. So I'll start with a state. Let's see if I can get back to where I was. Actually, I'll open another window here. Did I lose the Wi-Fi? No, oh, there we go. So we're right here in the salt in, in the source code. And we'll look at states. So here's some of the things that we can manage with salt states. Come back over here and take a look at um, one of these states that we were actually running. So one of them was package. Here we go. And there's a direct one-to-one -one mapping inside of, this, inside of this data structure back to the actual states, which is one of the reasons um, why we've received, frankly, a lot of contributions. It's very easy to grok how to extend salt and how to make it do anything that you want or need it to do. So let's see if this is pulled up yet. Yeah, we're closer. So actually, let's take a look at this guy. All right. So we've got a CMD. That's a bad example. There's an abstraction layer there. OK. We've got package. And so that maps directly to package. inside of the states directory. It's calling this installed function, which maps directly to installed. And then we're passing a name, which is an argument. Effectively, inside of these SLS files, we're just calling functions inside of these state modules, which means that if you write a state module and add it to salt, all it needs to do is have functions Stuff with underscores in front of them are ignored, which makes sense to the Python developers in here. Um, but all we have to do is make a function, put in a state module, and give us some arguments. And that will directly map um, back over to these SLS files. And so we can see that if we're using package.install, we can pass version, refresh, and some extra information in here for different arguments. And then all you have to do with these state modules is return an expected data structure. And it'll just work. You put it in there, and it'll just work. Yes? So I'm kind of curious. Since there are multiple eons just going out into the cluster, many, 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 and some of them fail, so they're in inconsistent states, what do we do about it? A, that, so basically, you know, mm -hmm. now you're looking at OK, the question was, um, if, if there's an inconsistent state somewhere, can you A, roll back to an earlier, to an earlier state? 
um, and B, how do you track that? Um, I'm probably not going to have time to actually, because we're almost out of time, um, to demo a full state run. But I'll have some up over at the booth over there to, to show a little later. Um, but when you, when you run a full state call, uh, it's going to return a data structure which defines exactly what happened. So it'll tell you what states failed to occur and, um, and all of the changes which happened. Uh, so, and, it's, and it's a pretty, it's basically just a dictionary. Uh, so you'll be able to see very clearly what's, what's going on and go back and report on that data. And then uh, the other question was, can you roll back? Now this has come up a lot, and, and the reality is, is that rolling back is a really complicated thing. And, and especially when you're, when you're approaching something from a generic perspective. Um, so, so long answer short, not yet. <laughs> um, the, the methodology to roll back would be that, uh, that many, that, that all the states have counter states so that you'd be able to say that, well, this used to be this or this should be this, watch a history, um, go back into the history and then replay components of the history. Um, we're working towards it, which is one of the reasons why, uh, why, why the return data that we use is very, very extensive and very detailed as to these are, this is, it gives very clear lists of these are all the packages that were installed when this was installed. This is all the diff output that, that occurred when this was installed. This was a new file. So that it's going to be possible for us as our development continues to be able to do very reliable and very clean, um, the word just left me. Yeah, rollbacks, thank you. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Thank you. All right. So, again, they're all just Python modules. If we go back in here and I looked at modules, very straightforward. If we want a module named disk and we're going to call it from the command line, we're going to say disk dot whatever the function is, usage, and it'll return everything. This means that the, that the salt source code is very, very self-documenting as well, since you can just say, well, what arguments does that take? And you can look at it. But uh, they all, we do have real documentation as well. <laughs> We're not falling back on that entirely. So that brief overview there. Let me, let me wrap up. I'm going to show you our documentation site. Um, I talked about how we can extend things. Okay. So the goal is a different approach to config management. Something that is as terse and simplistic as possible. Something that is fast and easy to set up and gets out of your way. And something that's very easy to maintain. Something that hopefully doesn't break very often and just works. And, and we're developing more and more components on top of this communication system, which is the backplane. Because we've developed, because what it, what it, what's all really is under the hood is a way to make servers generic in, in the way that they communicate and, and make it generic in such a way that, uh, that you're able to just interface with all of these different pieces of software in a very clean way. Um, we do have a company behind Salt that's under development. We have a training, we have a training class. Uh, that goes into a lot of depth as to exactly how to set up um, the different capabilities of SALT. And, um, uh, and we're looking to have enterprise support deployed fairly soon. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention before I ask for final questions is where to look for information about SALT. We're in the process of replacing our .org. But we do have extensive documentation. Ah, whoops, it's not .com. Um, it's up on Read the Docs and Tutorials. So tutorials on installation. We've actually got some tutorials specific to certain distributions. Um, Tutorials on getting started with configuration management. 
that'll walk th that will walk through a lot of the concepts that I've talked about here. Talking about how targeting works, we only talked about regex, or sorry, globs and grains, but you can specify groups for targets, you can specify compound matchers so that you're doing things like, uh, like saying, well, target it if this glob matches, this regex matches, and these grains match, but not this grain. So that there's a lot of different layers and levels of depth. Um, full documentation on all of our modules, so you don't, you don't have to go to GitHub and look through the source code. That would be very unprofessional of us. <laughs> and full list of all of the states. So you can come in and say, oh, I want to understand the package state. Oh, there we go. Okay. And more and more and more and things that are deeper that we could never possibly have talked about within an hour. <laughs> okay, any questions, comments, arguments, rebuttals? Yeah, so put some salt. <laughs> so put some salt on your lunch. I, I actually tried to get some little paper salt packets with our logo on them, but no, that didn't happen in time. <laughs> um, we, and, and we also, we've got, we've got a, a day of training that we've got. Actually, quite a few people signed up for. I'm really excited on Sunday. Um, and we've got free t-shirts for all y'all over at the salt booth. Okay. We good? When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Asterisk. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. 
At DGM, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Astros cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Astros and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a, a thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Is, uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail, and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Well, stack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack, they were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack, as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the cloud stack. <laughs>